Good morning and welcome to this service of worship. It's wonderful to see all of you who are here in the sanctuary and to know that others are joining us online as we gather to glorify God this morning. This is my last Sunday here. It's been wonderful to be with all of you. And um, I want to give you a heads up. Next week, Omar Gonzalez will be back again, preaching from the book of Ruth. If you didn't see uh, or, and hear his first sermon on Ruth, it's on YouTube. And he'll be back next week for the other, for the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Following next Sunday, Dan Williams, who is the stated clerk and executive presbyter here in Central Florida Presbytery, will be with you and preaching. So you're in for a treat both weeks. And then on the 22nd will be Craig's first Sunday in the pulpit. The future is very exciting. The um, Wednesday night program, Oakland Wednesdays, Live begins for children and youth on the 18th of August. Got it right. Thank you so much. Aging fast. Um, but so please, if you have people who qualify for those groups in your household, let them know that's coming up. And watch the space for Wednesday night courses for adults later in the year. That concludes the morning announcements, except to say it is now possible if you want to make an offering of flowers for the worship service to do that online. I can't tell you how to do it, but our trail can and will be happy to. Let's worship God. to worship using the call to worship that will be on the screen and is also in your bulletin. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. But in comparison, the days of our life on this earth are one moment. So teach us, Lord, to count our days that we may be wise. Be us here this morning. Remind us of your steadfast love so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Yes, let us thank and praise God for every minute. Let us worship God. Our hymn is Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above. Please stand as you are able.
Friends, if we say we are without sin, we are strangers to the truth and there is no help in us. But if we make bold to confess, scripture tells us, God who is faithful and just is ever ready to hear and forgive. In that assurance, let us confess to God now, first using the prayer of confession that you'll see again on the screen or in your bulletin. Almighty God, the giver of life and forgiver of sins, we come to you now with hope, hope because you always love us, even though at times it seems like we have been forsaken. Hope because you do not hold our sins against us, but instead grant us your grace. Hope because you turn our hearts toward you and give us the courage to trust you in a world filled with darkness. Help us, Lord, to confess our sins, remembering that your son died for our sins so that we might be reconciled to you. Create in us the desire to serve you faithfully in all we say and do. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please turn and greet your neighbors with Christ's peace.
At this time, I invite any children who are worshiping from home at this time to come a little bit closer to the screen. And any children or any children at heart who would like to join me for the children's sermon, I invite you to join, join me up front. <laughs> Good morning. Come on. <laughs> I love it. All right. Good morning. I am so oops, sorry. I am so glad to see you guys here today. You know, I was thinking this morning, there is a lot of change coming up. Today is Pastor Paige's last Sunday with us. And we have um, Pastor Craig who will be joining us soon. And we'll be having a new um, music director who will be joining us hopefully soon, and school starting soon. For all, That's a lot of change. And sometimes change, what comes with change, it comes worries or what ifs. And it got me thinking of a poem from a book that I like, Where the Sidewalk Ends, from Shel Silverstein. And there's a, there's a whole poem on what ifs. And this is what she says. Last night while I was thinking here, some what ifs crawled inside my ear and pranced and partied all night long and sang their same old what-if song. What if I'm dumb in school? What if they've closed the swimming pool? What if I get beat up? What if there's poison in my cup? What if I start to cry? What if I get sick and die? What if I flunk the test? What if green hair grows on my chest? What if nobody likes me? What if a bolt of lightning strikes me? What if I don't grow taller? What if my head starts getting smaller? What if the fish won't bite? What if the wind tear, tears up my kite? What if they start a war? What if my parents get divorced? What if the bus is late? What if my teeth don't grow in straight? What if I tear my pants? What if I never learn to dance? Everything seems swell, and then the nighttime what ifs strike again. That's a pretty long list, isn't it? And I, bet, I wonder if maybe you might have some what-ifs to add, add to it. But then I got to thinking about all the what-ifs, and then I got to thinking about our scripture verse today, which comes from Romans 8. And it said, for I am convinced, which means I am very, very sure. The person who wrote it named Paul said that. And I am sure and certain that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor what ifs, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you know what that means? Not one single thing will ever make God's love go away. Not one single thing. Not for you, not for me, not for anyone out there. Phew, that's some good news in a midst of what ifs, huh? To know that love will be with us no matter what happens, or does not happen. Isn't that good news? Yeah. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, help us to remember no matter what ifs we worry about, no matter what comes our way, your love is with us to stay. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you'll join me now for Children's Church. you just need a minute to decide. <laughs> Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for your word which comes to us fresh every time we turn to it. As we turn to it this morning, we pray that you will silence in us any voice but your own so that we hear not just with our ears, but also with our hearts and are inspired to follow you all our days through Christ our Lord. Amen. The scripture today is from Romans, Romans 8, 28 and to 330 and 38 and 39. We know that in all things God works for good with those who love him, 
those whom he has called according to his purpose. Those who God has already chosen, he also set apart to become like his son, so that the son would be the first among many brothers. And so those whom God set apart, he called, and those he called, he put right with himself, and he shared his glory with them. And verses 38 and 39, and I'm reading today from the Good News Gospel. For I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor any other heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world shows above, not the world below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Connie, for sharing that word with us. And thank you for sharing it from the Good News Translation, which is a little different from what was on the screen and helps us understand it better. Thank you. So today, as we all know, we come to my last Sunday with you. It's been a privilege to serve as your pastor during this interim time. It's been a joy to get to know a lot of you, to be with some of you as you celebrated the lives and mourned the deaths of loved ones. To welcome new people into the church, both new members, new regular worshipers, and just two weeks ago, the newest member of the Hoff family, Palmer, when he joined their family and ours in, in his birth. <clears throat> When we began, none of us thought the pandemic would still be going strong as it is now, or that our lives would be changed so much. The fact that the church has continued to be in ministry and witness in this community and far beyond is a real testimony to you, to the love and the fellowship that you all share, not just with each other, but with the world outside your doors. Deacons have been faithful to keep up with members even when we were in isolation. They brought food to the sick, to those who were mourning, and again, most recently to the Hoffs at the birth of Palmer. Sunday school classes have learned how to learn online and to hold each other in prayer and to stay connected, even across miles, using Zoom and more, more recently Zoom and hybrid communication, um, Zoom and in-person communication. This week, I thanked the Hope AA group for helping the church carry out its mission to glorify God, make disciples, and change the world by being a big part of the change the world part. And the leader of that group, that is to say the guy who makes the coffee and welcomes people and has made sure that everybody signed in so they could do contract, contact tracing during the pandemic and cleans up after they go, that leader said to me, pleased to thank you, that all throughout the last 17 months, the church allowed the Hope Group to continue meeting in person. He said, you know, a lot of AA groups went online, and I get that. They wanted to keep people safe from getting the COVID virus, and that's a good thing. But we chose, with the church's permission, to meet wearing masks because meeting in person is so important to us. And in fact, because we were meeting in person, word got around, and new people came to join us to learn sober living along with those of us who've been around a bit longer. That man celebrated 32 years of sobriety during the time I've been with you. And this week, the group celebrated the first birthday of a little girl born to two of its members. She came to be celebrated, wearing a beautiful blue dress that matched her beautiful blue eyes. And it was a great day of hope 
and promise for the Hope Group. I tell you that to remind you that this church makes a difference in this community that you may not even be aware of. And there are people who are grateful for the witness of this church. For this last sermon, I've chosen a text that is a part of the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Rome. We don't know who started the Roman church. Church tradition is that there were in Jerusalem Jews from Rome who had come to celebrate Pentecost, that Pentecost when filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter got up and preached and was so powerful and they were so impressed that the other disciples had spoken so that everyone could hear, hear in the language of each. But that day, 3,000 were added to the community of believers. The theory is that some of the 3,000 who were added went home to Rome and took the gospel message with them and began to meet in house churches to share the good news, even while they were going on Fridays to the synagogue as had been their custom. And the church spread in Rome, not only to Jews, but also to Gentiles, as was the case everywhere, as we know from the book of Acts. Later, when the Jews were kicked out of Rome, the Roman church continued among the Gentile followers, but they didn't know or care about Jewish law particularly. And so things changed in the church. And when the Jews came back, they were not happy with some of the changes and there was discontent in the church in Rome about, there were, there were differences of opinion about the right way to do things. So Paul writes this letter of introduction of himself to the Roman church. You may remember that Paul was a devout Jew and also a Roman citizen who lived in Jerusalem before his conversion on the road to Damascus. He was blinded, but then taken to a home and, and to that home, a Christian in Damascus named Ananias, not the one who died early in the book of Acts, but another one. Apparently it was a more common name then than it is now. Anyway, Ananias came full of fear, but also called by God to go and healed Paul. And Paul then became an itinerant preacher as soon as the Jerusalem council gave their okay. And he never lived for more than a year in any one place after that. He was a year in Antioch, but again, in the book of Acts, as we trace his life, we see that he went from town to town sharing the gospel, calling together a community of people who were converted, as he did in Philippi, the first church he started in Europe at the home of Lydia, a dyer of purple and a woman of means in the town. And it's a good thing that he established a church quickly there because within a week he was kicked out of town. He traveled extensively, first with Barnabas and then with Silas, meeting new people in every place, accepting hospitality, sharing the good news, getting arrested for disturbing the peace, and getting run out of town. So in the book of Romans, he tells the Christian community at Rome that he longs to visit them on his way to Spain to spread the gospel further and to see his friends in the Christian community there. In chapter 16, he lists those friends by name and there are 28 names of people with whom he has worked, people with whom he has been in prison, people he converted, people who sheltered and cared for him. He has the letter delivered apparently by Phoebe, a woman he calls a fellow deacon or minister, same word used to describe Paul. 
He wants to go and be with the Roman Christians. And for those among them who don't know him, he lays out his understanding of the faith, which is why the book of Romans is Paul's most fully developed theology. He talks about what it means to live by faith, even in times of trouble, like the persecution of the church that was already beginning. For the purity and welfare of the church, he cautions those he calls brothers and sisters there to keep an eye on any who cause dissension and offenses in opposition to the teachings that they have learned. Because such people do not serve Christ, but rather their own appetites. And the believing community is called instead to be wise in what is good and guileless in what is evil. The words which are our text frame and proclaim the heart of Paul's message. You've heard them often, often at funerals. He says, all things work together for good, for those who love the Lord who are called according to his purposes. Those people are predestined to be shaped into the image of Christ. They're made right with God by grace through faith called to lives of service and glorified for that service along with Christ. Nothing in all creation can separate the members of God's family from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Paul hoped, as I said, to visit Rome on the way to Spain, and he did go to Rome, but he never left. Instead, he was arrested in Jerusalem for disturbing the peace and tried and was found innocent. He could have been set free, but, but Paul, as a Roman citizen, had appealed to Rome, not knowing what would happen in Jerusalem. And so he was taken to Rome under guard and put under house arrest for two years before his case came up for review and while he was there under house arrest, he got to visit with those friends and make new friends in Rome and strengthen the leaders there through his teaching. Finally, when Nero was made emperor, he decided to make an example of Paul and so had him beheaded for failure to worship the emperor as a god. Well, it's an interesting story, isn't it, from a long time ago, about a hero of the faith. But you may be wondering what in the world it has to do with us. Several things occur to me that apply to the church today, to us here. Paul kept up with his friends in the faith, mostly indirectly, through letters. As I've heard some of you talk about things getting back to normal, I've wondered what Paul would have to say about that. Because after all, Paul knew that the church was a family scattered around the world. And the same is true for us. You know, or at least know of the Turks, our mission partners in Madagascar, who soon will be returning to Madagascar where they have lived most of their adult lives, serving directly in ministry there. You may remember a few weeks ago you saw a video of them talking about their work. I have a friend, I have friends around the country and around the world uh, through the church. One of my friends lives in Pakistan. He is currently, until the end of this year, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Pakistan. He teaches in Gujinwala Seminary, which is where my grandfather taught when he was in what is now Pakistan. And because of that connection, we have developed a friendship that stretches back, I think, seven or eight years now. We've only seen each other face to face once at the New Wilmington Missionary Conference. But we have talked on uh, Facebook Live, we have exchanged emails, 
we have prayed for each other, and, and, I, and we count each other as friends. In fact, recently he asked me if I would um, edit what he does for a newsletter to be distributed by the Outreach Foundation to help generate funds for the seminary. I've been impressed with what he's had to tell me during the pandemic about how the seminary going online has meant that the teaching could be distributed all over Pakistan, wherever there is internet reception. And in fact, they are strengthening leadership for the whole church in a way that they never did before they began to reach out online. I have been fascinated by that, just as I have been fascinated to see people on Zoom for Sunday school classes, for the men's prayer breakfast, for the Thursday night theology group that we have shared, for lots of things, states away. Some of them come back here seasonally. Some of them will never live here again, but have strong ties of love and fellowship with this church and so are able to be with you because of the technology we share. Things are never going back to the way they were. But distance makes no difference for the love of God's family. Paul's faith is a witness to ours and an example for us of the difference that life in the light of Christ's love makes. His whole life was changed in his encounter with Christ, and I also have to think in the fact that the Jerusalem Council, on behalf of the whole church as it was at that time, accepted him and sent him out to preach. Paul who had persecuted the church, was accepted by the church as one to share the gospel. And so he went first with Barnabas and later with Silas, teaching and preaching and establishing churches. I think it's a great reminder to us, to you, who later on this month on the 29th, will elect a new class of elders and a new class of deacons to leadership here. To remember that none of us is called to leadership in the church except in community with others to whom we are accountable and in humble reliance on the wisdom of the congregation that calls and the grace of God that supports. Paul's words of caution about relationship with those who would cause dissension and offense are wise. They remind me of our own rules of discipline in the Book of Order, which is provided not to punish, but to call those who stray from an understanding that we are in community together to repent, to be restored, when they alienate themselves from the community through any kind of wrongdoing, abuse of office, abuse of persons, for which there are criminal as well as, as church penalties, we know. But even, even if gossip, dissension, separates them from the community as better than, as other than, it's a way, it's a failure to be willing to put the interests and welfare of the community ahead of one's own interests. And it tears at the fabric of faith, and we are all called to that really countercultural notion that we are not first individuals, but first members of a community, the body of Christ, God's witnesses in the world. So after today, I won't be with you. It's been a joy. But it will also be a joy for me to return to that portion of the household of faith 
where I have shared in worship and fellowship since 2003, Park Lake Presbyterian Church, <clears throat> where I will join with others in teaching children's Sunday school, which happens during church. We take turns in twos teaching once a month. We plan together and then take turns instructing the children, following the plans that we make together. I have encouraged Tiffany to encourage you to develop a similar pattern here because knowing the children, sharing faith with the children is a part of what we promise when we stand at the font and baptize them. And it's a lot of fun as well. I'm doing it even though I miss communion at Park Lake because my Sunday is the first Sunday and that's when they gather at the Lord's table. One of the rules of our tradition as Presbyterians that you already know is when a preacher leaves a church, he or she only returns at the invitation of the current pastor. I asked Bob and Pat to join us at the reception that there will be after this service and Bob said, we're not going to do it. It's your day. It's your party. And yeah, we didn't have one, but we did have a drive-by, and it's okay. And besides, have you seen what the virus load is like these days? We're not coming. And I, you know, I'm sorry, but I can respect that. The rule is provided so that the congregation is free to establish strong ties with its pastor. You all know that from Bob. A few of you have said to me, yeah, but after you leave, we can still be friends, right? And my understanding of leaving as your pastor is, I never want to put you in the position of a relationship that you have to keep private from your brothers and sisters in Christ in this place or risk resentment developing because we know each other still, and they don't. People are people. It's just, it just works better that way. So I've said in each sermon in recent weeks that you are headed into an exciting new future with your new pastor, not just because you have a new pastor, but because God is sending new neighbors all around you. This community is changing. And the old ways of doing things, the old normal, isn't going to work anymore. So I won't come to visit, but I promise as you experience the new that I will pray for you and that I will hope that in some way our time together has been a blessing for you and a way of preparing for what's ahead. I will rejoice with you in the future that God has in store, a future different from and yet grounded in the work that God has been up to among you since 1887. For I am convinced that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now will you stand as you're able and affirm your faith with me using the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The hymn? I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs>
I do beg your pardon. I forgot the hymn. I love that hymn. How about the hymn? Diana, I'm sorry. I'm old. You know, I had a birthday this week. It's time for me to quit. Let's sing the hymn. Good. You can sit or stand. Suit yourselves. <laughs> to prayer, Spirit of a Living God, was written in Orlando at First Presbyterian Church by Daniel Iverson, who was in the music department there when he wrote it and was struggling with issues of faith in his own life. So I give you that history, and now the choir will give you the song. Gracious God, we thank you for the rich past that is ours in the church and for the future that you have in store. 
We thank you most especially for the love which we know through Christ Jesus, our Lord, who did not count equality with you as something to be grasped, but humbled himself. We're grateful that you want to know the deep concerns of our hearts. And so we lift them up to you now, asking that you will draw especially close to those who are ill, facing surgery, struggling with treatment and doubt that goes along with it. Grant your healing mercy and the comfort of your abiding presence that helps people remember in anxious days that you are always with us and go with us everywhere we go. We pray that you will draw especially close to those who mourn the loss of loved ones in the comfort of your love reminding them that parting in this world is but for a season. And while we mourn that we will not know our loved ones again in this world, we rejoice that they are with you and that one day we will be too. We pray for those who are anxious about their next meal, about where they will lay their heads. We pray for those who are anxious about the spread of the COVID virus, which seems to come on us wave after wave after wave. We long for the day promised by the prophets when everyone will live in safety under their own vine and fig tree. And we long for the day when we can gather without masks, when we can travel without wondering about the people we meet when we travel and whether they will infect us or we them. We pray for people in harm's way as the Taliban rears its power in Afghanistan and in Africa. And we pray for peace, peace in the world peace in the hearts of people everywhere. We pray that you will inspire among leaders of people in every place a passion to work for peace, a knowledge that leadership is a trust for the welfare of those who are led and for their neighbors. Especially we pray for people starting back to school in the days ahead as teachers and as students that in these anxious and uncertain times they go forth to teach and to learn with confidence wherever it happens whatever is required for safety and that it be a good year of learning and growth we pray for your church in this and every place that you will use the church to be an instrument of your peace and of your love, that you will hold in the hearts of your own the confidence that we belong not to ourselves but to you and are called to life in community to serve together in your name. All this we pray in the name of him who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. and offerings. If you have brought an offering with you today, there is a box 
in which you can put it on your way out the door. We do not pass the plate at this point, but we are grateful for your gifts, however they come. The generosity of this congregation makes its ministry possible, and we thank you. Gracious God, we ask that you will bless and receive these gifts and the givers to use us to do your work in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For him is Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing.
remind you that there is a reception in Fellowship Hall and you'd be most welcome. There's plenty. I want to thank the choir for the anthem. It is a particular favorite of mine, written by John Bell of the Iona community, a wonderful community of believers in Scotland. And it was really wonderful to hear you all sing it this morning. Thank you. And now go from this place, go to live, so that those whose lives touch yours know something of the love and mercy of God and grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.